Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. That was one of those gospel readings where at the end it's kind of weird and hard to say praise to you, O Christ. As uh, many of you may or may not know, today is the second to last Sunday of the church year calendar which is why one of our themes that we're focusing on is the end of days, the return in victory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the subject of our gospel reading today and our meditation on God's word. And God says something very interesting here. Jesus is teaching his disciples, and he uses the word endure. Now, often when we think of the fighting of the battle of spiritual warfare that Christians are called to engage in, in our sinful and fallen world, we picture ourselves running at a foe with an armed weapon and attacking. But here Jesus says something different. He says, endure. Have any of you ever been in a contest of endurance? The object of the contest of endurance is a bit different than an attack. It's really a contest to maintain a form under duress of some kind. This made me think of a time back in 2006. I went to Philmont Boy Scout camp in New Mexico. And I went with uh, my Boy Scout troop, and we did a pretty intense hiking trek. Over 12 days, we did 110 miles. And you're carrying your backpack 50 pounds or more on your back the whole time because you're carrying all your food and your clothes and everything with you. So it's a contest of endurance. But even in the midst of that, they have these camps that have staff on them, and sometimes they have some games. And one of them, they were living their lives as if they were um, like 17th century loggers. And they had these rock breakers, which are basically a big steel rod. It's probably about seven feet long. And they weigh about 17 to 20 pounds. They're really heavy. And that's so that they can clear um, large rocks. They can break them into pieces or or till up difficult soil to deal with as they clear trails. Well, their competition was that they would have the, uh, the, the groups that would come. They would try to do a contest of endurance. They had a couple of these. And you would go one against another, mano y mano. And you had to hold this steel rod out with your arms straight for as long as you could. You couldn't bend your elbows. You couldn't drop it down. You had to hold it as long as you could straight out. If you've ever tried to hold something heavy straight out in front of you, you know it's not easy, right? Um, and my dad and his brother couldn't miss an opportunity to compete, and so they, they competed against each other. Um, and when you watch a competition like that, you usually see facial expressions like this. <laughs> right? Because they're enduring duress, suffering, pain, in order to maintain form. Maybe you've been in a contest of endurance, maybe not something like that, but maybe a long run race. Or maybe you do planks at the gym and you got to try and maintain your form for as long as you can until your whole body starts vibrating and you collapse on the floor. This is the word that Jesus uses to describe what we are to do as Christians amidst the evils of the world towards the time when he's going to return. He says, endure to the end. But then he gives us a pretty intimidating list. So let's look in the text here from Mark 13. It starts out with the disciples making, you know, an observation that makes sense. One of the disciples says, look, teacher, what wonderful stones and wonderful buildings, referring to the city of Jerusalem. Well, one of the most impressive buildings in the city of Jerusalem was the temple. And just to give you a little idea of this is really something that anyone would expect. If anything's going to endure, it's going to be this. So here's a little tidbit of factoid information about the second temple. So this is not the temple Solomon built, but the one that Herod built. And the heaviest stones that they used to construct the temple weighed 160,000 pounds. Many of them weighed less than that, but there are many. So large stone structure. If anything is going to weather time and endure, 
It's got to be something made out of stones that big. And then Jesus, almost, I mean, the first time you read that, you've got to think he's a little bit of a party pooper. The disciples are just making this observation, and then he sort of veers into this warning about the end of days. Oh, do you see these great buildings? Yeah. There won't be one stone left on another. They'll be thrown down, including those that weigh 160,000 pounds. And then he begins to tell them about what is to come. What is the biggest building that you've ever seen in your life? For me, I, it was when I was in Germany, I saw the uh, cathedral in Cologne, Germany. Massive building, survived World War II because it was protected, because it was such a large landmark, it, was, it allowed them to coordinate their air force efforts because it could be seen from so far. Maybe you've walked up to a building like that and just, it's unbelievably huge. Well, that is what the disciples are looking at, and Jesus says something like that is going to be destroyed. Not even one stone left upon another. So this text starts with his disciples picking something that they think can last forever, and Jesus says it's not going to. Now, we understand this text to refer to two events, right? In about 70 years, a little less than 70 years, in 70 A.D., the Romans come in and they completely destroy the city of Jerusalem. But he's not just talking about that. He's also talking about the day of judgment, the second return of our Lord, that all of these things to the world, the things that we think will endure, will not endure, but in fact crumble into dust. So he begins then this next section. He sits down with his disciples. And the disciples, of course, when Jesus says, yeah, these great big buildings, they're going to be destroyed, they're like, uh, can you tell us when that's going to happen? Presumably so that they can make sure they're not going to be there. And Jesus just sort of ignores that question and moves on to what he's going to say. In verse 5, he says, see that no one leads you astray. And we're going to come back to this small sentence because this small sentence is the key to understanding the point that Jesus is making here. See that no one leads you astray. And then he says, many are going to come and claim that I am he, I am the one who is to come. Do not follow them. You're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. But don't be frightened. Nation rising against nation. And if that isn't bad enough, natural disasters, earthquakes across the world, and famines, people starving to death. And then after he gives this long litany of horrible things, he says, this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning. Think about that for a second. And remember that he's calling us to endure. I don't know about you, but I'm not very confident in my ability to deal with even just the beginning of things he's listed here. Big world-shaking predictions. But then in verse 9, he transfers to the second part of this text. He goes out from this big world-shaking predictions, all of these disasters that are going to happen, and you might be wondering at that point then, where am I in all of that? What am I supposed to be doing? Where am I going to be? And Jesus enters into that section and says, but be on your guard. And then you'll notice that the verb, the, the subject of all of these turns to you. He's talking specifically to his disciples now. He's talking specifically to you and to me. But be on your guard because this pertains to you as well. You will be delivered over to councils. You will be beaten in synagogues. You are going to be called before governors and kings to bear witness to them about me. You scared yet? Can you imagine speaking in front of people who have such earthly power and influence? Now here again, Jesus is preparing his disciples because many of them do exactly this. 
Because in the Roman Empire, it is not legal to preach the gospel because the God of the Romans is the emperor. And any other God and following that God is an act of betrayal for the country. And so many of them do get brought before governors and kings. Many of them do get beaten and imprisoned for preaching God's word. And even today, many of our brothers and sisters throughout the world still experience such things. And here again, Jesus says that this is going to happen before the end. But he says, don't be afraid of those situations. Don't be afraid of what you will say, because you are not alone. Say what you've been given to speak at that time, because in fact, it isn't you that is speaking, but it is the Holy Spirit who has given you the words to say. And again, you think, all right, that's bad enough, Jesus. We can stop there. But he keeps going, and he hits even closer to home. So notice we started with this great, big, grand prediction about all these horrible things that are going to happen in the world. And now we're talking about you in terms of a nation, right? You are going to be called before authorities. You are going to be persecuted for your beliefs. And then he gets even closer to home and says that family is going to turn against one another. That brother will turn against brother, father against children, and children will rise up and turn in their parents. It's a sobering statement. That even something as foundational as the family unit cannot weather these things that are coming cannot weather the evil at work in the world and the effect of sin in our fallen creation and in our own fallen natures. And then if if he wasn't clear enough, he sort of sums everything up here in verse 13. And you will be hated by all, by all for my name's sake. Because you follow me, not just some people won't like you. It says you'll be hated by all. The world will reject you. And then right there at the end, right after he says all that stuff, he says, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And I got to tell you, the first thing that pops into my head with that little last sentence there is, how the heck is that going to happen? If even a third or half of the list that you've just named comes to be, There's no way I can endure those things. I mean, are you willing to do what Paul did and go around to all these different places, publicly proclaim the name of Jesus knowing that he was probably going to get beaten up or somebody was going to report him to the authorities and throw him in jail? It's easy for us to read that in the Bible because we know the end of the story, but when that's happening to you, it's not easy to endure. You don't know if you're going to get out. It's unlikely that an angel is going to come down and shake all the prison doors open. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. How is this possible? How can I endure such trials and tribulations? So many things that are beyond my control. What if I happen to live in a country that is antagonistic towards my faith? What happens if I find myself in the future in a place where I'm not allowed to read the Bible or gather publicly for worship? How can I endure those things? How can I endure being falsely accused and tried and beaten? How can I endure a call to witness to presidents and governors and kings? How could I endure betrayal and hatred from within my own family? I want to hop back to that phrase, see that no one leads you astray. Because at the end of this text, we're feeling pretty hopeless, right? If endurance is a context of maintaining form, I'm not sure I can maintain my form in the midst of all that. I mean, I have trouble holding up a steel bar for more than a few minutes for crying out loud. How can I endure all these things that Jesus has just given us a litany of? And you're right. You can't. You cannot endure this. I cannot 
endure this. But that's where this small phrase, see that no one leads you astray, is so important. Because you and I are actually not called to endure this. God knows. Jesus knows as he's teaching his disciples here that there's no way they can do this. But the one who leads them can. The one who leads us can and, in fact, has endured all of these things. When Jesus went to the cross, he didn't just pay for the sins of the, that, that people had committed up to that point, but sins for all time and space until he comes to make all things new. So all of these future predictions of horror, he has endured and come out victorious. No matter how great another leader is, another person who claims I am he, they cannot endure. Which is why he says, do not be led astray, don't follow them, for they will be destroyed just like the temple. They will pass away. They will perish under the weight of sin in this world. They'll fall to temptation. They can be killed. They can fall away from their faith. Just look in the Old Testament at the kings of Israel, and you get perfect examples of what happens when we follow human leaders. For they have the same flaws that we do. So today, on the second to last Sunday of the church year, as we look to the end of days, don't get bogged down in the gloom of the predictions of earthquakes and famines, of your own potential personal suffering and persecution for following Christ. Because your king is different. My king is different. Our king has endured all of these things and more. Do not be led astray, but follow Christ. Only in Christ can we endure what the world has to throw at us because he bears that burden in our place. Only in Christ can we endure worldly disasters and deep family strife. Otherwise, we certainly would buckle under such pressure. This is the gospel message that peeks through this sobering text in Mark 13. But the reason that Jesus calls us to not be led astray is because he is walking before us bearing the brunt of all of these things that he's teaching his disciples. When somebody is walking towards disaster, it's the person in the front who gets all of the hits. And you and I are not in the front, but Jesus is. We're staring at his back. Just follow him. Because then even if all the grand buildings that you've seen that have been built by the hands of man that we thought would endure crumble to dust, are destroyed in wars where it seems that our en enemies are triumphant, we can endure because we know that we possess something that cannot be destroyed. A savior and a king who walks before us who's called us to follow him, that in his presence shelters us from the destruction of these things. Simply look at his back and follow him. He will shelter you from the assaults of this world. By his grace, we will endure to the end and be saved through his strength and sacrifice and not our own. So dear brothers and sisters in Christ, do not be led astray. Follow Christ. For he has overcome the world, sin, death, and the devil. He will never collapse or be destroyed or worn away. He is the eternal victor. And his victory is yours. In the name of Jesus. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all human understanding guard your hearts and minds in this King, Christ Jesus even when you're enduring trial and tribulation in this life. May his presence in, you, in front of you be your peace until he comes again on that final day to make everything new. Amen.